uh, just say a quick warm welcome and thank you to Norm for being here tonight and um, doing this presentation for us. Norm is just a wonderful local naturalist who's always curious, a lifelong learner, um, and has really been an amazing participant the last few years in our pollinator action plan and um, learning about wild bees. So with that, I'm going to stop my share and I will turn it over to you, Norm. Welcome. Thank you, Bryn. Can you, am I coming through? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Anyway, thanks for joining. Uh, I'm going to make my usual disclaimer. Uh, that is, I'm not a bee taxonomist. Uh, I'm presenting this as a bee watcher. Bee watching is a little like bird watching. Uh, but with a difference, uh, as you'll see, I'm gonna turn my video off. Uh, basically, uh, this is about my participation in the Lincoln Land Conservation Trust Pollinator Initiative, which started for me in 2020, which was something of an adventure. Uh, just looking at this first slide, I mean, wouldn't you love a quarter acre of this obedient plant? This is. Uh, Physostegia virginiana, uh, this Baptisia australis, uh, you know, it's native to the south of us, but the Tinctoria actually attracts five species of bumblebees, and that is native. This knapweed up here, it just grows in meadows. You don't even have to plant it. Um, anyway, this has a beginning, a middle, and an end, but not necessarily in that order. See if I can get to my next slide. Anyway, this is how I got started. Uh, tell you the truth, I don't, I don't even own a square inch of soil to plant a single flower. But when I attended uh, Dr. Jagir's presentation in January of 2020, uh, I saw one opportunity uh, to participate and that was as a field data scientist. Uh, so anyway, there are three or four copies of Dr. Jagir's uh, video online, and I really recommend that you watch it at least twice. Uh, I'm not going to overlap a lot with it. I think what he said uh, will be the single most useful piece of information thinking about your, uh, your ecological gardening plans and how to think systemically about native bees, uh, some of which are in dire straits, and how you can garden to, in a sense, save the world. Uh, that's, of course, hyperbole, but there are at least two species of bees that may not be here in five to 10 years. Uh, so over on the right is the Beecology app, which is a web app. And my first year, I probably took 2,000 photos of bumblebees uh, and sorting through them made 375 uh, data points on Lincoln, identifying the bees and their native flowers. Uh, I, I would say it was quantity over quality. I fell into a trap. I didn't have the tutorials that are now on the website. And I didn't really understand bumblebee behavior, but I'll show you some videos here that say a lot about how to identify pollinating behavior and nectar gathering behavior. Um, over here on the left, uh, this is the Lincoln Land Conservation Trust has an excellent page 
uh, with links to resources about how you can order plant lists. Every spring there's a plant sale. And working with the collaboration between uh, Dr. Jagir and uh, Evan Abramson, uh, the owner of uh, Landscape Interactions, uh, created uh, an excellent, uh, just superb plant kits for getting started in, um, in uh, pollination gardening, uh, covering from spring right through fall. Uh, so there, you can also download Evan's Pollinator Action Plan, I believe, from the Land Trust website, and uh, Bryn can provide links to that. So it's really about going from ornamental gardening, which I grew up with, uh, to ecological gardening and understanding the flowering plant and bee interactions and planting very specific uh, native flowers uh, and shrubs and native trees in some cases uh, that will support some of our most threatened bees. Uh, the news is very good for some and very bad for others. <clears throat> Anyway, at the outset, I one of my handicaps was I <laughs> I could not identify many flowering plants. So part of my education was uh, <laughs> remediating that knowledge and working on websites like GoBotany. Uh, some of my identifications I put on iNaturalist, uh, many of them unidentified. Uh, there's way too much participation uh, for the amount of uh, curators on the site. Uh, so some of them haven't gone anywhere. <clears throat> some of the paper books that I have, uh, I would not say go out and buy these. If you're a gardener, I think Heather Holmes' book, An Identification and Native Plant Forage Guide, is absolutely superb. It's divided into two parts with life histories of the bees, their floral preferences, and the second half of the book uh, has an, an enormous set of plant lists appropriate to the Northeastern United States with instructions and, and uh, other uh, uh, phenological information, uh, life cycles of the bees and of the plants. Uh, my favorite book, I wish I owned a copy. I would pay $100 for it. It's been out of print for probably 60 years, 80 years. Uh, Bumblebees in Their Ways by Otto Plath, who uh, has a rather more famous daughter, a poet, Sylvia Plath. Otto Plath was a uh, German who a uh, hundred years ago taught at Boston University. He collected nests and reared bumblebees in captivity uh, in Bussey Hall, which I think was an unoccupied dormitory. Uh, he's better known for his work on um, honeybees, uh, but honeybees are outside the scope of this presentation. They're managed bees. Anyway, I'll refer to this amazing book again. And the reason is we have an almost, we have a, a very good picture of what we had a hundred years ago. Uh, it's an absolutely priceless document and his adventures collecting nests and how he found the various bumblebee nests uh, for captive rearing. Uh, and various adventures, uh, one of which I experienced myself, and I'll get to there. <laughs> if you want to participate in, uh, if you want to look at bees, uh, like bird watching, uh, it does require, I would recommend a set of tools uh, that would be close focusing binoculars. Unfortunately, uh, not all birding binoculars can focus as close as five feet. Uh, three feet is kind of ideal. These are very affordable, somewhat plasticky binoculars that are, I think they can focus half a meter, two and a half feet, uh, one and a half feet. Uh, they were, most people look at butterflies with them. Uh, a super zoom camera, if you want to photograph them. The view through the binoculars and the uh, eyepiece of a super zoom camera like this one that I use, uh, it's just incredibly immersive. Uh, you'll find that you're actually in the world of the bumblebee or any bee. Uh, of course, you can never experience <clears throat> what they're experiencing. There's a German word called umwelt, which is how 
animals see the world or how um uh but they see the world quite differently than we do and we're just spectators uh if you want another way to see bees and record them is with a screen phone works quite well you'll see a video i made just using my phone uh something's wrong with the screen on this phone it seems to be tilted anyway uh with hand gestures you can zoom into bees uh on your screen and um uh make both videos and take snapshots uh, the Ecology app was designed for use with sm uh, smartphones. Uh, I actually take still images and edit them. <clears throat> BFAX 101. Just a quick look at taxonomy. Uh, the history of bees is comparatively a short one if you look at the history of insects going back millions of years. Uh, bees diverged from wasps about 140 million years ago. Uh, some, uh, some scientists say 100 million years ago, but somewhere between those two numbers. Uh, it coincided with the advent of flowering plants, obviously, because uh, bees are vegetarians and wasps are carnivores. Uh, they capture prey. Uh, if it's on your hamburger uh, or on your sandwich, it's a wasp, not a bee. Anyway, it's called mutualism, the relationship of bees between uh, flowering plants. Uh, we'll look at, I'll look at uh, two, three, four, or five families this evening. Uh, I'm going to kind of oversimplify this. I think it's a hazard to... Uh, Overflow uh, to offer too much information. Uh, melted bees, we're going to skip. They're very rare, not very common. I think they can be found in cranberry bogs, and I don't know of a cranberry bog in Lincoln. <clears throat> so, when you're out looking at bees, uh, one of the things uh, that you're going to see are bees. Uh, that are not bees. They look like bees. They resemble bees. Uh, but it's called mimicry. And there's a very good reason for it. Uh, if you're a fly or a wasp, or I'm sorry, if you're a fly, uh, what better way to dress yourself up uh, as a stinging bee or imitating a wasp? Anyway, there are only two uh, actual bees up here. Uh, the rest are flies. Antenna length is the, really the only reliable indicator of a fly. If you look at the fly's antenna, they're all quite short. I understand there's only one fly species in the world with long antennae. Uh, but if you if you look up here, this is a robber fly, and you can see over here is a, I'm sorry, I need to go back there. The bee on the upper right here is a uh, genus Andrina. That's a bee. Look at the eye. Look at the eye on the robber fly. These flies actually uh, have uh, fur or uh, hair similar to a, a bee. Uh, on the left is a common uh, impatience bee, common eastern bumblebee, uh, but all the rest here are flies. Flies just have one pair of wings. Uh, it's a little difficult to see the two pairs of wings on bumblebees, uh, but I think the best way to tell them apart is to look for pollen connect collecting uh, uh, structures. Uh, Bees uh, collect pollen on hairy appendages or under their abdomens. Uh, these are called scopi. And you can see these hairs pick up pollen off of the flowering plants. Now, if you look at some of these flies, look at right here, uh, through evolutionary adaptation, they've developed scope as well. They're not as uh, developed as those on bees. It just takes experience. Uh, bees, uh, you really do have to look at behavior. 
and I'll explain that here. At right, is it a bee or a wasp? Uh, there are three bees here at the top and three wasps at the bottom, uh, the bottom row. But if you look between this, uh, this is a, uh, a hawthorn mining bee up here. I think it's on Spirea or something. But look at how close it resembles this tiffia wasp down here. Obviously, this is a female. You could see her scopi, which are her pollen, uh, the pollen collecting uh, hairs on her tibia. And on the wasp, it's imitative, but it's very undeveloped. Uh, bees forage in a particular, bubble bees actually have very distinctive foraging habits. So it becomes quite easy to distinguish them just based on their behavior and how they approach flowers and how they move with some deliberate action from one flower to another. Uh, wasps are confusing. They tend to just sit on flowers. Uh, they love nectar. Uh, they're only incidental pollinators, that is pollinators by accident. Uh, but even some wasps are hairy like bees. Uh, they're pileated, uh, pileated. This is a velvet ant here. Uh, it's not really an ant, it's actually a wasp. I've never seen them on flowers. They tend to walk on the ground and on rocks, stones. Uh, this bee up here is parasitic, this co uh, Coeliopsis. Uh, I'll get back to that in parasitic bees. Uh, but parasitic bees don't have pollen collecting structures. Uh, they parasitize, that is, they lay their eggs in the nests of other bees. <clears throat> Where do bees live? Well, most bees live in the ground. Uh, there are exceptions to this, but uh, bees are excellent diggers. They'll dig tunnels. Cellophane bees can dig down almost two feet. Uh, they'll dig brood chambers out and uh, put in, uh, stock them with uh, mixtures of honey and nectar uh, for the brood and lay an egg. They will seal off the brood chambers uh, from parasites. Doesn't always work. Uh, cellophane bees, this is a, a cellophane bee entering her nest. Uh, and I'm not even sure it's a female. It might be a male waiting for a female to come out for mating purposes. Uh, down here on the lower left is uh, Megachile. That's This is a leaf cutting bee. Uh, if you've ever walked and found a, through the woods and found a leaf with a perfect hole cut in it, uh, <laughs> out of the leaf, that means a leaf cutter bee has been there and taken that. Uh, they align their nests with leaves. If you're ambitious and want to attract bees to your property, you can create bee houses. Uh, over here on the right, lower right is, whoops, sorry about that. So we get back to that. On the lower right is pieces of wood with holes drilled in it, typically quarter inch to half inch holes. Uh, these are bamboo garden stakes. You can actually collect uh, uh, from your gardening when your shrubs or your plants uh, die out in the winter, you can actually cut plant stems and bundle them in a flower pot. Uh, just be sure you leave some uh, for the purpose of um, uh, feeding birds as they'll be bearing seeds. I'm trying to make this then go away here on the bottom. Excuse me. There's something blocking my view here. Okay, I got it out of the way. Anyway, this bee is hollering, hollow, uh, entering a hollow stem. It's probably an osmia, which is uh, a mason bee. So typically osmia, hoplitis is uh, a mason bee that seals off its nest with chewed leaves. And here, this is the sealing process here with the leaf chewing. Uh, there's always, uh, there are always um, parasitic bees and wasps that are watching for a chance to go in and lay an egg.
Some bees like these, uh, this is a Bombus griziacollis, uh, the brown belted bumblebee. Uh, it nests on top of the ground, uh, typically. There are exceptions to that, but uh, they're one of the easiest nests to actually investigate. Uh, however, I warn you, I had a bit of an adventure with these. Uh, their nests are uh, typically under dried grasses and um, uh, various uh, stems, seeds, other uh, stems and thatch. Uh, this nest I found behind Mill Street, barely at Lincoln, if it was at all. Uh, I lifted off the um, thatch on the top. It was like a like a toupee. And underneath, uh, after watching the queen fly in, there she was. She went into a defensive posture and rolled on her back. Uh, so I put the cop the the top back on uh, the cap and uh, came, I don't I think I came two weeks later uh, just to leave her alone. Uh, that is the time when I attempted a video documentation where I removed the top of the nest and uh, was pretty much attacked. Uh, it turns out, according to Plath, Bombus griziacollis are some of the most ornery, ornery uh, and aggressive of all the bumblebees. Uh, they didn't sting me. They uh, flew, the workers flew onto my camcorder and started stinging the camcorder. Um, I did manage to get a few of these photographs before I set up the camcorder. And on the left, these are both workers. Uh, they're the, uh, the bees that go out and collect nectar and pollen and stock the hive. Uh, they're sterile. They can't produce young. Uh, the queen is in there and she, once she go, once she founds her nest, she no longer leaves it. Uh, she's just an egg laying machine. Uh, this is a fascinating picture because you can see the nectar pot here. Uh, I don't know if these bees are closing it, but uh, they mix this nectar with pollen. Uh, the workers, they make a bee bread or a kind of loaf. Uh, and right here, this to me looks like a larva. Uh, the cell is uncapped. Uh, up here on the right, if you look at this, it's a little subtle. I have a little yellow, uh, yellow arrow pointing to it. Uh, this is um, uh, brood cells, most likely brood cells. Uh, in here is each one, the queen lays an egg and she puts in uh, the bee bread or the bee loaf. Uh, the workers do. Sometimes the queen will incubate on top of this, uh, on top of the brood cells. I could be wrong. These could be nectar pots, but my guess is this is what's called a comb, and it doesn't at all resemble um, a honeybee comb. Uh, they're very irregular and lumpy. It's a mixture of wax and vegetable matter. Anyway, I had to flee. Uh, I basically fled the scene. The bees were pretty agitated, so I covered them up and uh, moved on. I never went back, actually. Uh, the video, I got a few video clips, but they weren't very good. Uh, other uh, bumblebees will typically nest in rotted logs. Some bumblebees, uh, I would say most of the species we have, nest in abandoned rodent tunnels and autoplath had to dig seven to nine feet to actually find the nests in some cases uh, along the ground. <clears throat> Floral resources. Phenology is a topic that I think we have to reckon with because it has to do with timing, with life cycles, timing your flowers in your flower garden with the bees. Uh, continuity is a big issue. That is that you have flowering plants starting in at least early April, uh, right through October. Uh, at the top, these are actually graphs that I screen captured from iNaturalist uh, with thousands and thousands of data points uh, that map out the life cycle of each bee. Uh, Bombus bimaculatus, 
It has a short life cycle. It's typically the first bee I see in April, second week. By August, it's gone. Possibly a few new queens are flying around, uh, but that and the perplexus bumblebee. I was perplexed myself because those are the two species I never saw after August. They have an early cycle. Uh, Bombus impatiens, the common eastern bumblebee, by far, by far the most abundant bumblebee uh, goes from April right through up to November. So when you look at flowering plants, uh, you have to think about spring flowering plants, midsummer, this honeysuckle. Uh, this is a very interesting concept, a uh, very interesting example here. Uh, the aster mining bee, I haven't gotten a photo of one that's in focus, but look at the phenology of the aster mining bee. It basically lives underground, goes through a pupal stage, becomes an adult, it emerges in August, and it's gone in late October. It's a specialist on asters. Look at the phenology of the New England aster. That's the big purple one that you see, especially in the Culver Field, the Pollinators for People Meadow. Uh, they're almost absolute duplicates. So this is a very strong evolutionary uh, adaptation to a very specific set of flowers. Uh, some bees only go to one species of flower. Uh, most of the bumblebees are generalists. They'll go to several different flowers. <clears throat> so here are two phenologies for bumblebees. This is Bombus bimaculatus, also Bombus perplexus. These both finish their cycle by August. Uh, the new queens uh, don't fly long. Uh, they go into their hibernacula uh, on about August the first week of August, not to be seen until next April. Uh, Bombus impatiens has a long cycle. It, be, it peaks in September. Uh, you just see hundreds and hundreds of them. It is by far the most abundant bee, 1.4,000, uh, 160 reports for the two-spotted bumblebee in June. That's in Middlesex County. Um, Early spring is when floral resources are most scarce, uh, especially native floral resources. And uh, I think the best ones you see uh, and most common in Lincoln, of course, is red maple. Red maple is crucial to the earliest emerging bees that come out uh, to get uh, mostly nectar and some pollen from red maple. This is a red maple blossom. Uh, plum. I don't see a lot of it. It's a very good thing to plant. Uh, you can plant service berry if you live in the woods. That blooms in April or quite early. Uh, of course, at least in the wet areas, uh, the earliest uh, willow, salix, pussy willow, uh, is uh, a very important source for both Adrena and Caledes. That is, this is a mining bee, a Bradley's mining bee. And uh, I wish I could make this thing go away. There, it went away. Um, anyway, Caledes, uh, Caledes inequalis, that is the unequal uh, cellophane bee. That's the first bee I see. And I'll, I have a really good slide on those. Uh, this is a pair mating on a willow blossom. Uh, willow is an unusual plant in that the female plants and the males are totally separate, totally separate plants with separate flowers that look different. Uh, this Andrina, I had to have it identified on INAT. I couldn't tell you. Andrina are almost impossible to identify from photographs. Uh, the yards now are filled with snowdrops and even crocus. I have seen uh, both cellophane bees, these and occasional andrina actually go to snowdrops. I see far fewer bees on crocus and scylla. Scylla is one of the most unproductive <laughs> bee flowers that I've seen. I don't think I've ever seen any bees on scylla, which comes a little later. Uh, these are just garden plants. <clears throat> Get 
this. These are the first bees, uh, the first bumblebees I see come out quite early now. Uh, going back to Plath's time, I'm seeing them in many cases two weeks before his first observances. Uh, he was active uh, with his work with bumblebees between 1921 and 1933 and published his book, I think, in 1934. And I don't know if there were Korean rhododendrons, which are ornamentals. Uh, Korean rhododendrons bloom uh, around April 8th, 7th or 8th. And they seem to bring out uh, two species of bumblebees right off, mostly uh, Bombus bimaculatus and perplexus, Bombus perplexus. This is uh, some kind of common rhododendron, maybe a week later. Uh, you'll see uh, what I think is a Korean rhododendron in the Peace Garden in South Lincoln. And you might see a chap there with a camera and a flash uh, <laughs> when you're driving by going to the post office or Donnellan's. Uh, so these non-natives are kind of fill-ins. Uh, I go down to behind St. Anne's. I'm waiting for two years to see a bumblebee on a, on a native willow, and I have yet to see one. Uh, but they do like the nectar. They are also inadvertently, these are pollen grains uh, on, on the pile of the two-spotted bumblebee. Two-spotted because of these two lobes. <clears throat> Uh, about a week later, or a few days later, the uh, Bombus impatiens, the common eastern bumblebees, show up. Uh, another week later, Grisia collis. Uh, both vegans and fervidus, they come end of May, they're much later. They need long tube flowers uh, to thrive, and they're rarely seen early. Anyway, these are the largest bumblebees of the year. These are the queens, typically called gynes. Uh, they are the queens that were born last late summer and uh, moved to hibernacula. They overwintered. Uh, they mated last fall with uh, the males. The males die out. They, the males leave the nest. Their only mission is to mate with these new queens in the fall and uh, they overwintered. They actually store the eggs and sperm in their bodies separately, and the eggs are not fertilized until the queens uh, actually find a nest site. So if you go to the Peace Garden April 8th, 10th, uh, you'll see the very first queen bumblebees uh, earlier than just about anywhere that I've noticed. There are native uh, azaleas, uh, you know, pinkster flower, swamp azalea, uh, but the native rhododendrons bloom somewhat later, typically into June. <clears throat> I love this picture because when I saw it, uh, I remember as a, as a schoolboy, we had an assignment to read Shakespeare's The Tempest. And of course, what immediately came to mind was Ariel's song, <laughs> where the bee sucks, there suck I, in a cowslip's bell I lie. And I just looked at this and felt like I could sit in there with that bumblebee. Uh, that's a um, two-spotted or Bombus bimaculatus. And uh, this is a rhododendron that is in front of a house where I used to live. Uh, you know, it's probably a South Carolina or a North Carolina native rhododendron, but here it's an ornamental. Uh, but bumblebees just love it. They just can't get enough of rhododendrons. Um, another occurrence, the queens, uh, this would be, this picture was taken April 19th. Uh, this, uh, this is a Bombus bimaculatus, uh, searching for a nest. Uh, nest searching is something all the queens do, and they're really quite picky. I watched this bimaculatus bumblebee for maybe eight, 10 minutes, she checked every little opening in this pile of thatch behind the St. Anne's Church in the meadow there, peering into every opening, exploring uh, some of the more inviting openings. Uh, however, uh, she rejected it and flew on. I followed her a while. She checked out another potential nest site. Uh, I, then she went into a nest site near one of the orchard trees and didn't come out in the 40 minutes I was there. 
convinced that she'd found her nest site, uh, but a nest never appeared there and I never found her nest. So I apologize about these videos. Uh, Zoom is not video friendly. It's going to be a little choppy. Uh, they restrict us to about 15 frames a second. However, Bryn will share a link with you so that you can see these videos in smooth action on my Vimeo page. Uh, Canadian wood betony is a very good uh, flower to plant. It can tolerate dry and you can buy it as plugs. It, it doesn't always work from seed. Too early for bobbins. This is a spot, a bee watching spot for me on the land trust corner. And there's a patch of uh, wood betony there. Two spotted bumblebees are the first to patronize the wood betony. She's obviously having difficulty and she's chewing on the flower to get in. The two spotted bumblebees are long tongue species. They can um, actually get to the nectar in these deep, uh, these long corolla tube flowers. That was a rose breasted grosbeak that you heard singing in the background. Nectar and pollen. This is the food of the of all bees. Uh, nectar is an energy source, it's pure calories. There are some minerals in it. Uh, pollen is protein and they can't raise young, uh, they can't raise brood uh, without protein and without pollen. So this is standing around near Browning's Field near the high bush blueberry. And typically I see first, second week of May, uh, the blueberries are blooming and the two spotted bumblebees have tongues long enough to really get up into the nectar, uh, which is, yeah, this is a two spotted. Uh, when you get into June, uh, a, a very, a very good plant. If you just have lawn, uh, the Prunella vulgaris, uh, common self heal. I really recommend it as does, uh, Rob to gear because uh, it does so well on lawns. You can actually mow it, it'll flower lower, but if you leave islands of it, uh, Bombus impatience just loves the stuff. Uh, I see fewer of the other bumblebees on it, but I haven't been observing it enough. Here, here you see the, um, the pollen basket on the impatience bumblebee, it's called a corbicula. Uh, if you saw that video I made a few years ago on bee identification, uh, explains that quite well. Uh, this, anyway, this is uh, Dervilla lonicera. This is northern bush honeysuckle. This photo with a perplexus uh, worker bee, perplexus worker bumblebee, was taken at the Harrington uh, Twin Ponds pollinator installation. Uh, there's some bush honeysuckle there, and it's very much favored by. Bombus impatience and Bombus perplexus. I don't see other bumblebees on it quite enough. Uh, if I only found one flower that attracted at least five bumblebees, and that was Baptisia tinctoria. Baptisia tinctoria is a really good one to plant because it has a long flowering period of at least two months. And I have documented five species of bumblebees on it, including the threatened uh, Bombus fervidus. Be careful with prunella, there actually are some lookalikes that <laughs> you could be fooled. You also have to think about pollen in your garden. And I had a lot of fun uh, photographing and making videos of uh, bees on pollinator sources. I mean, on pollen sources, uh, I think this is shrubby. I don't think this is spotted St. John's word. I think this is um, uh, prolificum, which is the shrubby. It has uh, enormously copious and dense uh, stamens. 
And I think it has these glossy and pointed leaves. Uh, I'm not very good with flowering plants, but I'm getting better. If Evan is on the call, he can correct me. <laughs> anyway, this, uh, uh, be sure you plant roses. I have video. I have lovely pictures of uh, bumblebees on the various Virginia roses and the other kinds. These um, meadow sweet is really strictly a pollination plant. I don't think bees get much nectar from it. When I first went out, I thought they were nectaring on it. When I watched the videos later, I realized these are basically pollination, uh, pollen sources. Uh, spiderwort, I don't know where it comes from. It's a garden plant. I see it around. Uh, but bumble, uh, bumblebees like to sonicate it for pollen. I have a little uh, phone video I made uh, showing the sonication. That is the bumblebee vibrating the flower to get the pollen off. Oh, here's a, uh, oh, I love black cohosh. Uh, one of my friends has it in her yard or two of them. Uh, two friends have black cohosh. Uh, this is a... Um, common Eastern bumblebee collecting pollen. You'll see these rapid shaking movements. When bees move like this, they're in a pollen collecting uh, mode. <clears throat> That was a gray catbird calling in the background. Oh, I love this. Here's an example of sonication. Uh, turn up your volume because uh, the audio is very important. I, I hope you could hear that. Uh, even phones are good recording devices for bumblebees. I'll play that again. What the bumblebee is doing is she's unhitching her wings so that uh, she can vibrate the plant without her wings being activated. And it makes that higher pitch sound. <laughs> uh, Bryn might have a link. This is actually a PBS uh, video with it's just absolutely superb quality, better than anything I could do. Uh, we'll skip that for now, otherwise we'll be here uh, too late. Anyway, as late summer and fall comes, uh, the, uh, uh, the flowers change quite a bit. Uh, most of the bees that you see in late summer and fall are the males. Uh, they spill out of the nests. Uh, the males are e most easily identified by their hairy faces. Uh, you'll see a lot of yellow. Uh, they almost look like they have mustaches. Uh, this actually looks like a worker here. This is a worker. It's a worker, which is a female. She has a uh, pollen basket uh, on her leg, rear leg. And this is a bombus impatiens. This is a Bombus griseocollis, I think. Yes, on uh, bull thistle. Bull thistle is not native, of course, but like most of our thistles, but it is an absolute nectar fountain. Uh, I've seen uh, the somewhat uncommon at this point, fervidus on, on bull thistle. If it's in your meadow, I'd say leave it. Uh, it's a great nectar plant. If you're lucky you, and you have jewelweed, don't cut your jewelweed down. Uh, it's, uh, I find that Bombus vagans, which is a medium to long tongue bee and one of our threatened bees, uh, just loves jewel weed. I've seen also Bombus impatiens, but mostly Bombus vagans. One of the problems with jewel weed, uh, I had a patch near my workshop, but the deer have been grazing it off. <laughs> so I haven't had a good year with that lately. Uh, verbena. Uh, blue verbane. Blue verbane, this was taken in Chapman's pasture, uh, which is just rich in blue verbane, uh, blue verbane uh, at least in September. 
and we get into the season of the Cynthiotrichum, which are the asters. The aster is a huge family with hundreds of species. I cannot identify most asters. I just leave them at the genus level. And uh, they are a huge uh, food source in the fall, uh, along with goldenrod, which tends to dominate. This is a goldenrod spike here. So one of the things that uh, one of the uh, something that happened was when I was photographing and participating in the bee ecology project, documenting bumblebees and their flowers. Of course, I saw other kinds of bees as well. Uh, these were incidental, uh, sort of like the first, the very first bee of the season uh, that I see is uh, the uh, Calidus inequalis. These. Um, I would say next week, if we get a day in the 50s, uh, three things have to line up. You have to have sandy soil. There has to be red maples nearby, or at least uh, willows, flowering willows. Uh, these live in the ground. They, they form aggregations. Uh, that is, these are all solitary females that build nests uh, in a small area, sometimes a very large area in a park. Uh, the males uh, circuit around them, flying overhead, looking for females to mate with. But the females are charming the way they peek out of their nests. Uh, this is very likely a female that's already mated. She's building, um, she's created, uh, or she's in the process of creating brood chambers uh, along her tunnel. And she's, uh, uh, she's guarding it from, uh, uh, from parasites. There's a beetle that parasitizes these bees. Uh, it sneaks an egg on the female and she accidentally deposits it in the brood chamber. Of course, it hatches before her brood and totally consumes it. Uh, I've heard estimates of 20 to 50% of the nest can be lost <clears throat> or uh, brood chambers can be lost to uh, this beetle. Anyway, the females uh, create these little sand volcanoes now it's not an ant, an ant makes a much smaller opening. If you see an opening about the size of a pencil uh, this March, uh, these are called uh, tumuli. It's singular is a tumulus. Uh, typically you see several together over a gravelly or a sparse lawn area. Um, the area where I took these pictures probably had 15 or 18 uh, little nests with several males. Uh, so these are the males. I can tell they're males. They have this, uh, these bushy mustaches. Uh, they don't have pollen uh, carrying uh, abilities or not much. Uh, this is a male here. You can see he has a very bushy mustache. Uh, Calides are easily identified by their heart-shaped faces. See how the face Forms. It foams down to a point and forms a heart. Uh, no other local bee that I know of has that quite that shape. The three things together, sandy soil, uh, the phenology would be the blooming of the red maple and the um, willow and mid-March, the timing. Uh, these bees are active about two to four weeks. So they spend most of their lives in the ground in some form. Uh, the young will form, uh, will hatch into larvae underground. They'll go into winter in a kind of pre-pupil state and then become adults over the winter and emerge uh, maybe the second to fourth week of March. Uh, these are some males that are emerging and uh, ready to go looking for a date with a female. Most abundant bees, thousands of species, the mining bees, Andrina day. Uh, I can't identify most of them. This one here, Bradley eye uh, on a willow blossom was identified for me by a taxonomist. And uh, this is a male, you can see his mustache. Uh, no real, pretty, no real uh, pollen collecting. Uh, they're typically just nectar nectaring. Uh, I don't, 
This is Black Huckleberry, I think. I don't remember where I saw it. I think it was on the power line cut behind Mill Street. Uh, but there's a, there tend to be generalists, but there are actually a few Andrinas that are specialists and only go to one flower. Uh, and when that flower disappears, the bee becomes extinct in that location. <clears throat> But pretty much anything you grow in your garden will attract Andrina. Most of the ones are generalists and not too fussy. How do you identify Andrina? Well, if you can get them to genus, you're doing pretty well. Uh, they have these uh, distinctive hairy facial depressions that uh, I hope you can see my, my pointer. Uh, these tend to follow the inside margins of the eyes. They're difficult to see on males because the males have these hairy faces. Uh, the frigid mining bee here is a very common one, actually, and comes out very early, mid-April, uh, or at least on the first willows. Uh, this one I caught and released. I needed a good photograph for identification purposes, so this is taken in a, in a collecting vial. <clears throat> uh, but I couldn't tell you the spe these two species. <clears throat> They'll never be named. <clears throat> Another huge family, probably 6,000 species in North America, uh, are the sweat bees, the halictids. Uh, they tend to run small, average length about a quarter of an inch. Uh, they come out later. I don't see them as particularly early bees, except for the lasioglossum. That's this one here. Uh, these are a little bronzy color. The lasioglossum is the only bee I've ever seen on a wild geranium. Um, Wild geraniums don't seem to be big bee attractors. <clears throat> but sweat bees are of interest because uh, they're generally solitary, but they're also examples of communal uh, aggregations. And some of them, uh, some species uh, form primitively uh, use social nests. So it's sort of like, uh, they're not quite as advanced as bumblebees in that regard, which are fully eusocial. Uh, but this could be an evolutionary, this could be evolution in action. They could be moving towards, some of these could be moving towards uh, becoming fully eusocial uh, bees. <clears throat> but most of these nest, uh, nest in the ground. A few of them will nest in rotten wood. I've drilled holes in rotten wood in a vegetable garden and at least in one case, a sweat bee uh, used it. Uh, <clears throat> so I was sitting there, I was working on a set of, repairing a set of steps and something caught my attention. I think I saw a bee fly into this hole and it turns out, I think the diameter is about a quarter of an inch. It's perfectly round. And this Augochloropsis metallic green sweat bee, whoops, excuse me, I don't know what happened. Uh, flew into it and then turned around and just peered at me. Every once in a while, she'd go back in, but she's clearly nesting there. She's probably building brood chambers. Uh, like the Kalides, which I forgot to describe, uh, they line their nests with um, um, a substance that they make uh, with their duforous gland. It's called the duforous gland. Uh, the Kalides that previously I showed you two slides back, uh, they line their nests with a cellophane-like substance that essentially waterproofs the nest. Uh, they waterproof the brood chambers, and when they seal it off, uh, they waterproof that as well. So that's the name cellophane bees. Uh, these also line their nests with secretions uh, from the duforous gland, as most ground bees do. If their nests aren't waterproof, the nests are basically destroyed. Uh, fungus and bacteria can invade. So these brood, the brood in the brood chambers, the eggs and the larvae and the pupa, pupae uh, are very dry uh, right through the whole cycle. Uh, this is a bee, this is a very common sweat bee, one of the most common I find, uh, these metallic uh, green sweat bees. Uh, there actually are some wasp lookalikes. 
there these are actually fairly easy to identify if you can get a macro photo i'll show you one on the next page uh, but uh, this one i had in a vial i of course i released it but you can see that what are called sutures and various patterns on the exoskeleton and the shape of the eye uh, darkwing sweat bee is a late summer early fall bee you can see it's on an aster uh, these are associated, I think, with asters for the most part. So their phenology uh, starts in late August and runs right through October. Uh, for example, you wouldn't see one of these in the spring. Uh, this here, this is just a furrow bee. I could never get it to species. Uh, it, um, uh, they're, they're helictids as well. I don't know a lot about them. It's obviously a, a female. She has a pollen collecting um, ability on her uh, femur. Bicolored sweat bees uh, are just stunning. If you raise purple cone flowers, you might see one to three. Uh, this is a great uh, habituator of the purple cone flower. I think they're really attractive. I didn't have a good camera in those days that actually could get an enlarged picture, but I'll show you on the next page. Uh, what we have here, uh, let's see, next slide. So identification of the metallic green sweat bee is each bee has very, very peculiar shapes uh, on the interior margin of the eye. Uh, the species Pura has this suture here right on the face, what's called the clypeus. No other metallic green sweat bee has this. Uh, and down here, oh, it got pushed off the slide. Let me get back there. Anyway, this is the agapostamon, the bicolored striped, striped sweat bee. Unfortunately, I accidentally pushed it off the slide a bit too far. Uh, but that's about as close as I can get. This is on a corn flower, or some um, ornamental flower at the food project. <clears throat> uh, another fam another uh, family of, of bees, extraordinarily abundant, uh, although I see the same four or five species uh, you know, most abundantly, and then every once in a while some very infrequent bees. Uh, my favorites are these miniature bumblebees. They're not actually bumblebees. Uh, they're osmia, which are mason bees. Uh, they'll just live in rotted wood or mud dauber's nest. Sometimes they go into holes in the ground that are already created. Uh, these uh, bufflehead mason bees, <clears throat> they're quite small, uh, but they have these shaggy hairdos. And they are very common in the the land trust pollinator installations. They just love going to the, you'll see them going to the Penstemon uh, as well as the Baptisia. Uh, this down here is an unidentifiable mason bee. Uh, they come in beautiful metallic greens and blues. Uh, the, the, they're typically identified these days. You have to actually send them in for barcoding, DNA barcoding. Uh, most bee scientists don't dissect bees that much anymore. You just send it in and get it barcoded. <clears throat> but these these bulbous, hairless abdomens, very round. Look at over here. Uh, that generally signifies an osmia or mason bee. These here occur rather early. I find them every year uh, on the daffodils at the pollinator for people's garden uh, next near Culver Field behind the Smith School. I don't know why these daffodils are here, but uh, they do provide convenient um, resting plat mating platforms. Uh, these were uh, these are a managed imported bee uh, from Asia for fruit crop fruit crop pollination. I think they're called commonly called the horn faced mason bee, uh, but they're very early and very common. You can see the male with his mustache, the females down here, she doesn't have one. <clears throat> this is uh, the Penstemus hirsutus uh, with the osmia, uh, with the uh, bufflehead mason bee. They just go right up into those things. 
Uh, another super, super common bee, uh, a family of bees uh, that are incredibly diverse. I, there wouldn't be time uh, to uh, review all of them. We sort of need to move through this. Uh, this is a leafcutter bee. Uh, this is one of two species. Uh, this one, you'll notice the feathered tarsi and the female will cut a bee. She will stand on a leaf and she will cut around herself on the leaf. And when the leaf breaks away, she simply flies off with it. It's sort of like sitting on a branch and cutting the branch off while you're sitting on it, cutting towards on the tree side. Uh, if, you, if you see a leaf with a perfect hole cut out of it, uh, that's the work of the female leaf cutter bee. Uh, one of the distinctive characters of these bees, if you look right here, they collect pollen on their abdomens. These are their scopi, which are their pollen collecting hairs. Uh, and here, this has some pollen on it as well. Uh, I think Rich wants to be led into the into the Zoom. I'm losing my so there's uh, some very light yellow pollen. Lespedeza is a very common uh, gar uh, plant, both in wild meadows. Likes dry locations, well drained soil. The flowers are quite small. Uh, but it brings an enormous number of these megachile bees. Uh, this is, yeah, this is uh, Anthidiellum. This is the northern rotund resin bee. Uh, these are quite small. The, oh, man, I think they're only about three-eighths of an inch. Difficult to photograph. They jump around quite quickly, uh, but they're beautifully uh, marked with these yellow spots and stripes. Uh, this is a resin bee of some kind. I think it's a bellflower resin bee. Uh, I'm not really sure, but it's also visiting the Lespedisa herta. Uh, kleptoparasites. Uh, of course, like wasps and other insects, uh, each of these families has its own parasites. Uh, klepto, uh, this is the, uh, on the lower left, uh, the Coleoxus modestus. It's a kleptoparasite that uses the point of its sharp abdomen down here. It pierces the nest linings of the megachile bees like the leafcutter bees and the resin bees. And she will lay one or several eggs uh, in the provision brood cell. Of course, her larva or her eggs hatch first, and her larva destroy the host bee eggs in the larva. <clears throat> I mean, there's a balance in nature because they can only in, uh, parasitize so many nests, and it somehow works out, and they coexist. But uh, nomad bees, I see, I've seen dozens and dozens of these. Uh, they don't collect pollen or do anything. Uh, except mate and parasitize the nests of other bees along the same guidelines uh, that I described. Wool carter bees. Uh, there are several native wool carter bees. They're more common in the West. I'm just looking at some notes here. Um, Seven. Let's see here. Oh. Anyway, wool carter bees, uh, these are non natives. These actually were brought over. The European wool carter, uh, Manicotum, uh, this is crown vetch, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but they, uh, they build nests with mixing conifer resins. Uh, they collect plant hairs and they collect mud. Uh, and uh, they collect plant, uh, plant fibers. And with those plant, plant fibers, mixing it with the resin, uh, they apply them to the walls of the brood chamber. And this is, uh, again, a plastering mix, similar to the Kalides, the plastering bees, uh, where they're uh, strengthening the walls of the brood chambers and waterproofing them. <clears throat> I've never seen one actually collecting plant fibers, but there's certain plants like mullen that have um, very woolly surfaces, and that's what they're looking for. Uh, again, Lespedisa seems to be a big attractor for these, uh, including these two mating ones. This is one uh, 
uh, one anthidium chasing another. Um, I think this is this is oblongatum, which is see it has this rather oblong shape. That's another import. Uh, you really have to go west to see the native anthidiums. Uh, they're typically west of the Mississippi River. I think this is a male chasing another male over a female. Uh, so I believe these are two males and uh, obviously one of them won the prize. Digger bees. Digger bees I saw almost exclusively at the pollinator gardens uh, on uh, Penstemon. So these, uh, They're absolutely uh, considered fantastic buzz pollinators. They're common uh, also on evening primrose. You'll see them on lupin. Uh, they're enormously productive crop pollinators, uh, especially tomatoes. Uh, they're really bees that we should encourage, and I love seeing them. You'll easily, uh, if you get the right angle, uh, you'll see uh, their their terminal part here, uh, which is why they're called the orange-tipped wood digger bee. Uh, they nest typically in the ground, possibly in dense rotten wood, uh, but they fly right in. They'll go way up into the penstemon flower, uh, both species. They come a little bit when the penstemon first bloom. I don't see them before that or much after. <clears throat> Longhorn bees. I don't see a lot of these, but uh, they're named longhorn bees because the males have typically very long antennae. So this tribe has that name, uh, Eucerini. Uh, the, <clears throat> uh, I was in a private garden and on I saw this two-spotted longhorn bee. Uh, they're late in the season, uh, probably August, maybe into September on this panic, in this case on um, I think it's panicled uh, tree tick foil, Desmodium paniculatum. A uh, very tiny flower, not particularly showy, uh, but these black, uh, very dark uh, melisodes or two spotted longhorn bees just love the stuff. Uh, they were there for several days. Down here, I never had this identified on iNaturalist by a taxonomist, but it was on a thistle. Uh, so, uh, and Having looked at many pictures and doing some photo matching, I'm pretty convinced it's an Eastern Thistle Longhorn Bee. Uh, the, uh, this is a bee that's probably matched to its food plant. So, uh, being late, it's probably a male just collecting nectar. Uh, they also nest in the ground uh, and they're solitary. Very few of these nest communally. Uh, but these uh, these uh, emerge quite late in the year. This bee is worth talking about because this is a, a squash bee, a pruinose squash bee, Peponasa pruinosa. I saw a few of these, but this poor guy, this is a male on a dandelion. Uh, the squash blossoms are long gone, and he's had to adapt to moving on to other floral resources. Uh, without pruinose squash bees and other squash bees, we wouldn't have, the squash wouldn't set fruit. Squash bees kind of moved into our area uh, with the expansion of squash farming uh, probably several hundreds of years ago as the Native Americans brought them in. But um, the squash bee, uh, according to my notes, um, they fly very early in the morning. Uh, they're absolutely remarkable in that uh, the squash bee is up before dawn uh, that's because the squash flowers open uh, before at dawn, and they pretty much by 11 or 10 in the 11 in the morning, the blossoms close. The males will, off, will stay inside the squash blossoms, but the females uh, have already done their pollinating <clears throat> very early in the morning. <clears throat> Let me go to the next one. I won't spend time here. These are carpenter bees. Uh, these large carpenter bees, Xylocopa virginiana, these are the bees that drill holes in your house trim. Uh, they're not particularly admired bees. They're also nectar robbers. Uh, they chew holes typically in the bases of these long tube flowers like this Monarda and steal nectar. 
these small carpenter bees are a totally different story. Uh, this is a pair mating on the daffodils, which seems like the only thing daffodils are good for. <clears throat> um, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. They'll nest in hollow stems. Uh, bumblebees, uh, they're the largest of our wild bees, and I think the easiest to study. They're, they're really our, our um, study species for the Beecology Project. Uh, they're basically the dump trucks of pollination, and they're charismatic. I just can't resist them. And they're also bees that are fairly easy to identify from photographs and on site. Uh, I can't say that about Adrena, but bumblebees are the easiest to work with, and they're just delightful. Uh, I love seeing them on their flowers. I don't know what that's if you go back to that. So anyway, I'm going to uh, talk about two of our bumblebees that may not be here in 10 to 30 years. Uh, Bombus furbitus, which has, uh, if you saw the identification video I made, uh, it's described most easily by uh, the most yellow over more than half its abdomen. Bombus vegans is a two striper. And uh, this locally, this uh, Ternarius was a freak thing. That was at Ricky Farm. I just found this one worker, it's one female on oregano. Uh, locally, very rare, uh, just extraordinarily unusual, but not a significant bee in our area. And it never has been uh, a bee of any real importance here. They tend to prefer higher elevations. But going back to Otto Plath, uh, he, uh, they were actually quite rare in the metropolitan area back then as well. <clears throat> uh, Plath actually describes these all really well and what he had, uh, what we had back in the 1920s. Uh, three of our species are pretty much extinct from the area. Bombus affinis uh, disappeared probably in about five years, maybe in the 1990s. <clears throat> I'm sure I saw one when I was a child. Uh, they're now confined to a few small areas in the upper Midwest and in the Mahon uh, Monongahela Mountains in uh, West Virginia. Uh, they are actually nationally listed uh, uh, as uh, for threat of extinction. Bombus griseocollis loves, loves milkweed. Uh, Bombus griseocollis was actually quite rare. I think that uh, uh, hundred years ago, uh, uh, Otto Plath only found, uh, I think he only found five nests, maybe three nests over 20 years. Now they're the second most abundant bee. Uh, Vagans was more common than it is now, we believe. Uh, their status is somewhat unknown, but believed to be declining. Fervidus was much more abundant. It was common 100 years ago. It's now declined quite seriously. It seems to be hanging on uh, due to vetch and red clover, which it loves. And that may keep it going for some years. But uh, most of the Bombus fervidus I see are hanging on near the pollinator gardens, both in the cities in Somerville and Cambridge and in Lincoln, uh, especially where you have Monarda and Penstemon. Uh, that are long tube flowers. This is a long tongue bumblebee. It cannot feed on an aster. It has to have long tube flowers and you have to plant those for it. Uh, anyway, uh, the three bees that are gone from our area, uh, Bombus tericula is confined in small numbers to the western part of the state. Uh, a specimen was collected in Lincoln in 1938 and probably disappeared from our area 40 years ago or more. So that's on retreat. Uh, Tenarius here is not threatened in its native range. It's actually common and it's secure. But Tericola, uh, the one that's gone now, I mean, uh, Plath found 20 nests. <laughs> you know, I mean, they were, they, they were a going concern. But Bombus and Patience, uh, this bumblebee up here has increased since uh, Autoplast studies in the 1920s. It's now the number one. Uh, Bombus affinis, which is extinct here, was more abundant and it's gone. Uh, 
anyway, this is this book, and there is a copy in the Minuteman system. I hope no one takes it. Uh, there are really none for sale, except in Great Britain, there's one for sale for $130, and I'm not going to buy it. So these are our two uh, at-risk bumblebees, uh, Vagans and Fervidus, which just happen to be together on this red clover. Uh, Vetch, uh, you know, these are Eurasian flowering plants that came over here a few hundred years ago, and they are sustaining Fervidus quite well, but native plants... Uh, you don't have to plant vetch and clover. It takes care of itself. Unfortunately, vetch and clover are very uh, sensitive to drought conditions. I didn't see many fervidus last year, except at the pollinator gardens, because the vetch and the clover dried up. So the pollinator gardens sustain one colony over at the PFP meadow behind the Smith School. That's all they had. There weren't. There was no vetch and clover until the rain started in uh, end of early early September. Uh, Monarda is a good one to plant. Uh, even um, uh, any of the colors of Monarda, there's basically three species you can plant. Uh, Penstemon hirsutus I like because it has a long flowering period. It seems to flower longer than digitalis and comes out a little later. Uh, this is a two-spotted bumblebee up here honing in on the uh, hirsutus. <clears throat> uh, this is going on too long, so I'm going to kick forward. Anyway, by the time you get from September through October, uh, it's pretty much just the male bees. Uh, very few, uh, a few queens will be flying about, but once they've mated, they go into hibernation, uh, either in the, typically in September, and they're, uh, they're gone. I have found uh, bumblebees end of October into November, but they're all wandering males. They've probably have mated, and they just die at the first frost or when the flowers are gone is when they die. They just run out of food. This is really lovely. This is, uh, watch this uh, Eastern bumblebee on the giant blue, on the lobelia, uh, lobelia and on the bottle gentian uh, behind St. Anne's Church. Bryn will link you to some smooth versions of these videos on my Vimeo page, uh, which will play much better. You can tell it's fall because of the sound of the crickets and the katydids. So anyway, uh, this has gone on quite long. I'm going to cut it off now. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to go up here and look at the chat. I think there's some questions that have accumulated. Well, thank you, Norm. This was really wonderful. A great overview of the, the real diversity of native bees that we have in the area. I do want to be sensitive to people's time, so if you have to hop off, um, but we, I think we have time to take just a couple questions uh, before we call it a night. Um, so first question from Isabel, what is the best time of day to watch bees? It depends on the species, but uh, most bees, uh, come out quite early. I mean, after sunrise, uh, before sunrise, I think they're too cold. And uh, some bees, especially the males, they'll go right into early evening, uh, but just go out when there's daylight. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, and then a question from the audience. What's 
actually happening to the pollen when the bees are sonicating? Um, is it getting on their hair because of static? Well, yeah, that PBS video shows you how that happens. That uh, you could link to that for them. I think I sent you the link. Uh, uh, yeah, but what that. happens is the sonication stirs up the pollen into a cloud and it adheres to their body hairs, uh, to the pile on their bodies, and they groom it. They groom it to their uh, pollen baskets on their legs. Uh, they, they carry it back, uh, they groom it back, they sort of comb it back to their pollen baskets. It's a little hard to see in a video. It's uh, the pollen is very small, the pollen grains. That's that great. could be it for questions. Um, let me look and see if we have any more questions. All right, we'll give folks another minute and then we will call it. We must see any new questions. It's just amazing the the time it takes. I when you said that you had been following the one of the queens looking for her nest for 40 minutes, it's just kind of an awe that you have the, the patients out in the field to to sort of take the time to to follow them at their own pace to get those pictures and really observe their behavior. Uh, on that opening slide uh, with the obedient plant on the left, the Physostegia, I actually sat down. This was uh, in the Jagir garden. There was just one flowering. And I just sat down on the ground. I wanted to see a fervidus or something come to it. It was a little late in the season for fervidus. They come, uh, they tend to disappear. But uh, I think it, after 20 minutes, an Eastern common bumblebee finally flew up to it. And that's when I got that photo. <clears throat> well, it gets a, a good reminder of the beauty of slowing down and just sitting back and enjoying the world around us. Um, but I've not seen any further questions. So I think we will end there. Thank you again, Norm, for this wonderful presentation. I will, I have recorded, oh wait, we have one more question. What determines which bees become queens? Oh, that's a good question actually that I don't even remember. I don't know how to turn my video back on. Oh, here we go. Um, anyway, the queen I think actually can decide. She can choose males. Uh, the 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 unfertilized eggs in bees become males and the fertilized ones become females and she has some way of uh creating queens and i don't know what it is i forgot i actually started this almost three months ago and amazing how much of this stuff flies out of my head before the actual presentation <clears throat> That's okay, but it does seem like there's an active selection process. She picks one mm -hmm. egg and, and well, only one, one queen or potentially but, multiple. Yeah, uh, the founding queen uh, that you saw in the nest searching, uh, she typically dies somewhere during the process. And Autoplath would open nests and he'd find other queens in there, uh, succeeding queens. And sometimes they died as well, but there was a queen that typically near the end of the cycle, uh, queens uh, flew out and they're the ones that mated with males and then overwintered in a hibernaculum. Yeah, my knowledge of the life cycle, the details of the life cycle of the bee are pretty weak for me, but uh, that's, uh, uh, they, uh, the, it's just the queen that overwinters, uh, unlike honeybees where there's a living nest year round, right through the winter. Uh, there's nothing like that in the honeybee. It's just the queen hibernating and she creates the new generation. Well, thank you very much. That's great. Yeah. So we, we did record and Norm sent me some great resources, which I put in the chat. 
And I'll also send a follow-up email out to everybody that was on the call with those resources. And I'm sure I can track down a, uh, some, some kind of guide to their reproductive cycle so we can fully answer the question about the queens. Um, well, so thank you, Norm. Thank you, everybody. And have a great evening.